The Acer Triton 500 is a thin and powerful gaming laptop, but this combination generally equals more heat. So does this result in any performance loss? I'll be taking a detailed look at thermals and seeing how much we can improve performance with some simple changes. Let's start out with the specs I've got in my unit. There's an Intel i7-8750H CPU, Nvidia RTX 2060 graphics, and 16 gig of memory running a dual channel, so expect different results with different specs. You can find examples of other configurations as well as updated prices linked in the description. On the bottom of the laptop, we've got some air vents towards the back, while the rubber feet lifted up a bit to assist with airflow. Air is exhausted out of the back left and right corners and from the vents on the left and right sides towards the back. There's also some ventilation holes above the keyboard. I wasn't able to get a quick look at the heat pipes, as the motherboard is upside down in this model so it would require further disassembly to access. The Triton 500 uses Acer's Predator Sense software to control performance of the machine. We can control fan speed and swap between three overclocking profiles, normal, fast and extreme. I'll be considering normal the stock setting, I didn't find fast to do anything, while extreme boosted the power limit of the GPU from 80 to 90 watts. Turbo mode or the extreme profile also boosted the CPU power limit from 33 watts at normal to 45 watts while under combined CPU and GPU load. Though as we'll see later, this was different under a CPU only load. There's a turbo button above the keyboard which basically sets the fan speed to maximum and sets the overclocking profile to extreme. I didn't find turbo mode to perform any overclocking. However, by default, the GPU memory was always overclocked by 120 megahertz. With the latest version 1.06 BIOS, I also found the CPU was undervolted by minus 0.1 volts. This did not seem to be the case with the older BIOS. Thermal testing was completed in an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, so expect different results in different environments. At idle, the temperatures were looking normal. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU workloads, and are meant to represent worst case scenarios as I ran them for extended periods of time. The gaming results towards the upper half of the graph were tested by playing Watch Dogs 2, as I find it to use a good combination of processor and graphics. The stress test results shown on the lower half of the graph are from running the ADA64 CPU stress test with only the stress CPU option checked, and the Heaven GPU benchmark at max settings at the same time to fully load the system. Let's start with the stress test results. In normal mode, the temperatures are looking alright. No thermal throttling at least, just power limit throttling. As turbo mode raises the CPU power limit, we're seeing a hotter CPU, though the GPU actually lowers slightly as a result of the higher fan speed introduced by this mode, despite the GPU also seeing a power limit boost. My additional undervolt on the CPU didn't change the temperature, but we'll see how this affected performance in the next graph. Keep in mind that with the latest BIOS at the time of testing, the CPU was already undervolted by minus 0.1 volts, so I'm not actually changing it by too much more here. By adding the cooling pad, the CPU temperature dropped by 7 degrees while the GPU dropped by 4. The gaming results didn't see much differences. Basically the temperatures of the CPU drops down as we make these same changes with not much difference to the GPU temperature in this particular game. These are the average clock speeds for the same tests just shown. We can see an improvement to average clock speed of both the CPU and GPU with turbo mode enabled while under stress tests due to the power limit increase. Despite this, we're still power limit throttling. While undervolting the CPU did improve the performance further, power limit throttling is still preventing us hitting the full 3.9GHz all-core turbo boost speed of the i7-8750H in this worst case workload. The cooling pad changes nothing as thermals are not the limitation here. With the gaming tests, the change to turbo mode boosts the GPU clock speed as the limitation here was also the power limit, while the CPU undervolt again boosts the clock speed. These are the average TDP values reported by Hardware Info during these same tests. We can see at normal mode we've got the lowest numbers, as turbo mode increases the limits. In the game test, this didn't really seem to matter for CPU performance. These are the average CPU clock speeds while under a CPU only workload. With ADA64 and just the stress CPU option checked, I could only hit the full 3.9GHz all-core turbo boost speed of the 8750H once the power limit was manually raised. This is because of the power limits. In a CPU only stress test, I found both the normal and turbo mode would cap out at 45 watts. Pretty standard. But by raising the power limit, this workload needed around 51 watts to achieve full performance. It's worth noting that I couldn't raise the power limit with Intel XTU for combined CPU and GPU loads that we saw before, only for CPU only load. Raising the power limit does result in increased temperatures, as more power equals more heat. 
Though these were also lowered in turbo mode due to the increased fan speed, and the additional undervolting at the bottom helped improve this further. To demonstrate how this translates into performance, I've got some Cinebench CPU benchmarks. The results with turbo mode, which again is undervolted by default, and with my extra undervolt are honestly quite low, again due to the power limitations. As boosting the power limit did affect CPU only performance, this was the best way to further increase performance. As for the external temperatures where you'll actually be putting your hands, at idle it was around the normal 30 degrees Celsius. While under combined CPU and GPU stress test, in normal mode it gets to the mid 40s at the hottest points. Then while gaming with turbo mode enabled, it's perhaps just a little warmer in the center towards the back. The keys were warm to the touch, but I didn't think they were hot. As for the fan noise produced by the laptop, I'll let you have a listen to some of these tests. At idle, it was completely silent, no fans at all. Whether gaming or under stress test, with the fan at default, it got to the same volume. So you've got the option of running it quieter for a bit less performance. With the fan at max speed, it is louder, but now pretty much similar when compared to most other gaming laptops I've tested. Overall, the results aren't too bad. The thermals are under control and it's not getting too hot. Even under these worst case scenarios, I didn't see higher than 88 degrees Celsius. Notably cooler compared to most other machines tested with the same specs. This seems to be due to the power limits in place on the CPU though. And while this does prevent higher clock speeds, the clock speeds that we are getting in these tests aren't bad at all. Just a couple hundred megahertz behind the max possible boost clock. At least in these specific workloads that I always test. There are plenty of people who prefer this sort of limitation over a hotter machine, so I think it's a fair compromise. Many 2060 laptops don't have the option of boosting the power limit from 80 watts either, so that was a nice addition. Which, as we've seen, does directly result in better game performance. If you're on an older BIOS, you'll definitely want to consider upgrading for the default undervolt on the CPU. Without this, I'd expect worse performance due to those power limitations. These differences in performance shown aren't hard and fast rules. There are different factors which will vary results. Primarily the temperature of the room you're running in, application of thermal paste, and even the specific hardware, which comes down to the silicon lottery. You may not be able to undervolt or overclock your hardware the same as me. It depends on the chip and its specific power requirements. So don't just blindly copy my settings and do some testing to find out where your stable point is for best results. It may be possible to further improve temperatures by swapping the thermal paste. However, with review units that get sent back, I'm not able to change the paste. Otherwise, the next reviewer will unknowingly report different results due to what I've done. Undervolting or using a cooling pad are much easier for most people to do than changing paste anyway. And as we've seen, these tweaks did help improve performance and temperatures with the Triton 500. Let me know what you thought about the thermals from the Acer Triton 500 gaming laptop down in the comments. Would you prefer higher temperatures but also higher power limits and performance, or do you think the trade-off is worth it for a cooler machine? If you're new to the channel, you'll definitely want to get subscribed for the upcoming full review of the Acer Triton 500.